Okay, I don't need to go over that. We've done that basically. Um, okay. I told you when I used to do radio astrology, I did it for years, um, and I have a very high degree of accuracy, and I was pretty popular on the radio because people knew that they called me, they were probably going to get some something valid. It wasn't about it's a nice day to go buy a dress. It was like uh, you know you had an accident in 1976, and you're legally blind. I mean, I told people things like that, and they would be just astounded. Or uh, I remember once telling a woman she's a Baha'i. Don't ask me where that came from, <laughs> but it was true. She 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 invited us out later to one of the Baha'i meetings. But things come to you when you're doing readings, when you're doing charts. It opens up a whole realm of possible potential meaning that sometimes you can't see the relationship that got you there. I mean, you'll see it because you're looking and you see it and I see it, but to share it to somebody else and say, this is how I got to that particular thing, I can't, I couldn't tell you. Um, it's like I told you about Darwin, walking in the forest or in the fields with the two farmers and he's kicking up the sand and he says, you, you know, he says, uh, uh, you ain't got much clover here, you got a lot of rats. And the farmers are going like this, this guy's nuts. They're standing behind him a little bit, you know, and he's kind of walking around kicking up the sand. But he knew the relationship between clover and bees and rats, and he knew if there wasn't clover, there's no bees, because the only thing that pollinated was the bees. And the only thing that can destroy the bees and the beehives is rats. So he knew the connections in a way that others would never see. And as an astrologer, that's the kind of mind you're going to have, and you should have, or you wouldn't be in this field. Uh, you see connections, relationships. If you read my book, so many relationships. The words. People don't even realize how many words. You know, my wife was saying to me the other day about something. Are you satisfied? I said, I'm satisfied. I'm Saturn. I'm satiated. Okay, Saturn. Um, um, you know, so many of the words we use. You don't, people don't connect it. They don't see relationships well. And your ability to be a good astrologer is your ability to see these connections, relationships other people can't see. And uh, I think that's what makes a good astrologer, okay? Uh, and, you know, people think we're a little nuts, you know? You know? What do you mean evil spelled backwards is live? You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's amazing. You know, the, the devil spelled backwards is lived. You know? And Christ says to, the, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's the past tense. I don't want anything to do with the past. He said, they said to him, how can you speak of Moses and the prophets? You're not even 30 years old. He said, I am, and I am, and I am. He didn't say, I am, I was, and I will be, because he was the eternal presence. So your ability to be a good person, a good student, a good in love person is to be here now. I can't stress that enough. I know I get on you guys a lot about this stuff, but it's where it's at. Being here now. I showed you how the word know, K-N-O-W, has now in it. If you want to know God, you have to be in His presence. No way, you can't be in His presence if you're thinking about the milk you got to pick up later, or what are you going to do tomorrow, or what you did yesterday, or you shouldn't have done that, and you know all this stuff cluttering up the presence. You're not even here. One of my lectures I gave to a church in uh, on Christmas Day, Masonic Temple downtown L.A. Magnificent church. And it was the Christmas present that last. That was my Christmas message. And it's being in the present, the present of presence, the gift of gifts is this moment. It's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's this moment. So when we can be here now and be in His presence and in the presence of others, then you're in the presence of God. And God dwells in who? He dwells in you and you and you and you. He's dwelling in me. So, how am I going to commune with God? I have to be here now, don't I? I have to be with you now. Huh? Mm -hmm. But see, we don't, we miss it. You know, every... My ex-wife used to hate me when I said that. Every moment is filled with pregnant possibilities. No, she didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, every moment is filled with pregnant possibilities. It is. But we don't, we're not there to, to do anything, to love, to do it, to make it happen. You see what I'm saying? We're not, we're not involved in that moment. Because we're all thinking about yesterday, our regrets, recrimination, guilt, all this BS that gets in the way of being here. And my job is to bring you here. When I'm with a client, is to be with them right now, totally with them. And guess what happens when I'm with them? 
I'm in love with them. Not in a carnal way. I'm in love with them. I'm, I'm communing with them, their spirit. And that's what makes a good astrologer. Not about, oh God, I hope she pays me. I hope this is a good reading. God, I hope I'm right. What is all that? You see what's going on in the mind? What if you're just there with that person? You're completely there, absorbed in them. You know, I, I've said it over and over again. People don't care how much you know. You know how much they care? They care how much you care. That's what they all care about. And when you care, you show it. And how do you show it? Because you're, you're communing with them. You're not distracted. You're not, you know, you know, you're right there and you're right in the presence. Does this all make sense? Huh? Am I too preachy? No. Huh? But isn't this the core of what it's about? Everything else is extraneous to that. You know, I can teach you all the tools, all the mechanics of it all. I know it, okay? But I can't give you the dynamics. Okay, the dynamics you have to have in your heart, in your soul. You have to be a person that loves and cares others about others, okay? That's what makes you... And, and some people are hard to love. Huh? Aren't they? Some people are hard to love. But that... <laughs> I, I remember reading a book once, uh, a beautiful book. Um, Oh man, that's years ago, but I, I never forgot one, one thing he said. He said, who did you think it was that needed love? Who did you think it is that needs love? It's that person that's hard to love. It's the person that's unloving. It's the person that's really in pain. It's the person that's sick, that needs whole and healing. You hear where I'm coming from? And are you going to be the, the, the counselor, the healer, the teacher, that directs their life and brings them into a path of wholeness and completeness again. That's what I'm about and what I try to be about. It doesn't mean I'm every day on top of it, you know? Yeah. I sat down and she says, you're depressed today, aren't you, Ron? Did uh, you not say that? You're single now. I looked down, yeah, that's what. But see, I mean, <laughs> she picks it up, she picks up everything. And I mean, I, I of course denied it, but I was a little bit down. You know, and she picks up that energy. But guess what? I got back to my light again. I got back to the center again because I'm with you. Mm -hmm. And we all love each other. And we're here to be together as a harmonious group. That's what it's all about. So I get my life and love back by giving it, okay? That's what love's about. How do you get strong? How do you get strong? Well, my wife's going to run me to the gym after I say this. Mm -hmm. But don't you get strong by exercising and, and expanding and working out and okay how do you how do you get love you give it you have to give of yourself to get it back yeah, it's a, it's an amazing thing it's like two people sitting on a couch they can you know angry at each other i mean we've all been there i've been there with her we all do it kind of in our own little world well if she'd just be loving i'd be loving too you know who's going to make the first move she's good she, she's the, usually the first move she always comes to me always and uh, i'm very blessed because she's more mature than I am when it comes to all that. So I'm still a child in many ways. You know, and I know it. I see myself well. You know? To be blessed is to know what? That you're blessed. Mm hmm. Mm. Think we'll get through this? <laughs> Say, Ron, get out of this show. Love frees us from the curse of the law. Now, this is so important. Law is karma, what you sow, you reap. That's Saturn speaking. Okay, you got, you deserve it, you're going to get it. Or you don't deserve it, I'm not going to give you good things. This, think of Santa Claus when you think of Saturn. He's fair, he's just. He's hard, he's a hard taskmaster. And he demands a lot. But if you break the law, you're responsible for it. Okay? And then this guy comes along and says, you're no longer under the curse of the law. Christ. He says, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, you're free from that anymore. You don't have to be bound by that law. Hmm. That's called grace. You know what grace means? Unmerited favor. Exactly. It means unmerited favor. When I was in prison, a woman sent me a bunch of stuff, for nice things on Christmas. She, I'll never forget it beautiful package, all sorts of nice things in the package. And she didn't know me, but you know, she used to read my, I was assistant editor for the prison paper and I used to write a lot. 
and she read something I wrote, and we started communicating, sending me in mail and Christmas. So when I get it, I send back this this uh, letter to her. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, you know, and all that BS, and you know, I basically didn't accept it. Nice, you know what I mean? I I thought it was, you know, I don't deserve this. Why you do? She scolded me so bad. She got on my case so bad about learning how to accept and graciously take from others. And her name was Grace, Grace, graciously. And she taught me a hard lesson. And she really scolded me the way I received those packages and the, the, the gifts she sent me and how uh, really um, impolite it was to do that, you know, to say those things. So it's easy sometimes to give, but it's not always easy to receive. Sometimes we have a harder time receiving because we don't really think we deserve it, right? You know, I don't deserve that, okay? It's called unmerited favor, called grace. Okay, all right. Oh, you know, notice that love and fail, never faileth, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Tell me they didn't believe in prophesying. Of course they did. And so you're gonna find this is true in your case. You know in part, and you're gonna prophesy in part. You may know in full, and you'll have those moments where you just see it clearly. And then you're going to become well known because people would say, my God, that person, know, how do they know this is going to happen? Well, because you have the gift, okay? And it starts to manifest the more you work in it, okay? All right, so, so that's kind of interesting scripture, isn't it? Okay, I don't want to go about my life in prison. Uh, spending nine years in prison was a, a very fortuitous thing for me. Um, only Jupiter and Pisces would say such a stupid thing. <laughs> Jupiter and Pisces. Pisces rules what? Sorrow, self undoing, prisons, institutions. So, you know, and my son in the 12th house added to that, okay? So I got all that Piscean stuff. But it was very monastic for me, okay? And it was a time where I could do what I'm teaching now and share with you, okay? Okay. Okay. Not a very good distinction, was it? Okay. Okay. I told you that one of the greatest things about, I think, being in prison was the fact that nobody went anywhere for a long period of time. So far, if I saw something in their chart and I made a prophecy about it, I could see if it came up pass. I do charts for people out here and I may never see them again. I don't know really what happens, okay? I don't have the, unless they come back to me, some of my clients are there every year for me. They come back every year for another reading. Uh, and I begin to hear the stories of what's happened in their life. But in the general run of things, you're not gonna have that happen. Most people come to you and they're gone and they're out of your life and you never know what happened. So, so this is the control factor. Huh? Control factor in the, sci in the scientific experiment. Prison became the control factor. Good so for you. It was a beautiful, sure. beautiful laboratory. Sure yeah, it really beautiful was. Laboratory. It really was, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Okay, we all know about my book. Uh, of course, I'm on video, I'll say, you gotta read my book. It's a great book, it says the greatest, it's gotta be. I am. Anyway. <laughs> you are, okay. No, I mean, I am like, yes, I agree. There you go, thank you. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a book that is, a, I think, a profound, I think it's maybe the most important, how's this for ego, Sagittarius? I think it's maybe the most important single book ever written about religion and Christianity. I believe that, okay. And scholars that have said the same. And I'm not a scholar, but it's had scholarly reviews that uh, uh, one of them, which was this book should be compulsory reading for every thinking individual by one of the top scholars in the world, a linguist, speaks 48 languages or knows 48, Dr. Adam Mackay, University of Illinois. So, okay. Um, okay, and the other thing about this is. Uh, uh, um, you know, it's interesting. I use the word Holy Grail, and you did that too. But that, uh, they, it, to me, this is the Holy Grail of prophecy. It really is. Uh, and I tell people with, when I teach and I have classes and you have students, you all been doing your astrology for years, probably before you came to me. I don't tell you how to do it or not to do it. I say, look at. I, I live by a scripture that says, "Try all things, prove all things, and hold fast to that which is good." And I live that. If uh, somebody I said tells me something's going to work, I'll try it. I'm stupid enough to try it, as long as it doesn't hurt me or somebody else. And if it works, I'll probably keep doing it until it stops working and say, well, there's something to this, okay? 
And that's how I look at astrology. If you are using things that I don't, which I don't see any value in, doesn't mean you shouldn't use them because your spirit and your soul may resonate to that. And it might have some communion with you that I wouldn't have. Uh, I don't use asteroids, for example, which, you know, there's thousands of them, but you pick three or four and you use them, that's good. If they're significant. Or I don't use parts of fortune, parts of faith, parts of death, parts of marriage, parts, you know, all the Arabic parts. Everybody uses parts of fortune. It's in the chart when you do it. It's there automatically. I don't put any value on it. Uh, but I say if you're going to use that, why not use all the other parts? You know what I mean? There's over 150 Arabic parts. Is that how many there are? Yeah. Thank you for that. I didn't know the exact number. I knew it was a lot. Yeah, no, there is. Yeah. There's so. a part of spirit, there's a part of marriage, there's a part of death, there's a part of everything. Yeah. Like 150. So would well. you imagine if you put them in the chart with the 150 asteroids yeah. and the planets? Yeah. Okay. Barbara, that's beautiful. I'll yeah. put you up here. That's good. Yeah. You know, one of the things I feel about this is that you've got enough to work with. You don't need to clutter that chart with all this other stuff. I, I mean, everybody's doing cheer on now, okay? That's great. I Sometimes I leave it in my re the, the printouts. They're there. People like them, but they're very psychological. They can apply almost anybody, quite truthfully. But I don't say don't use them. I say if it works for you, use them. I don't particularly use them. I, keep, I found that keep it as simpler you can. Uh, you've got... If you knew the, how many combinations there are between aspects in a chart, house sign, uh, and planet configurations, you're getting into the hundreds of thousands of opportunities to see things. Now you clutter it up with all these other things like Barb says, you're going to be a mess. You're not going to read. You're not going to be a good reader. Can I just... Can of I just, course. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you're not sorry. You you're part of the class. But, um, you know, the, the, the basic planets, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, um, Jupiter, and Sa up Saturn, worked for virtually centuries upon centuries until they saw Neptune and Pluto, Pluto and all that. Yeah, you're and it worked like a, like a clock for thousands of years. That's right. It's classic and it works. And mm. it comes from mythology and then the, you know the Bible everything but but it's so true if you have your basics but I go up to Pluto but you have your basics you have everything you really do yeah everything and to teach someone that you're a teacher so you of course expound on that to the students but I can't emphasize it enough that you need to keep it simple don't get get this into a mess of complexity that it's going to just throw you off the course uh, and you know, Barbara knows she teaches and she knows that. I think also, um, there's a, there was something else that um, you had something about something in mind there. Anyway, let's keep it simple, stupid, kiss, K I S S. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple in astrology. It works better if you do it that way, okay? Um, so, all right. So three simple calculations, we're going to, we know what those are, we're going to work on it. Uh, in doing radio for years, uh, I had to be quick on my feet. And uh, I was using programs when they were just starting out in astrology on computers. And uh, I had a dear friend uh, who um, had a company in uh, Big Rapids, Michigan, Matrix, you all probably heard of them. And um, I used to go up and visit him there and, uh, and help him actually devise different ideas and thoughts towards developing his own programs. But um, he had a program called Astro Talk, and I actually named that for him. I said, that's a great name, let's call it Astro Talk. And what happened was, we were getting ready, there was a big convention coming up, and I said, why don't you make some little... Um, badges or anything that people can wear and say let's astro talk <coughs> and he thought it was a great idea and then one of his programs he called astro talk and I use that on the air because it's very quick and fast and the reason I use it is because it gave little readings along with uh, the aspects and their meanings and it was very quick to pull it up and the reason I used it was because if I'm on the air there's not time for a space between conversations I can't say wait a minute give me a minute let me look at this chart you need to keep that moment filled up with talk. That's what talk radio is, right? So I would be reading this stuff just to keep myself filled in until my particular interpretation came out and I saw particularly that meaning of that chart and then I would give it. 
And, um, and then I would do new moons and I would do progressed moons very quick, okay? Uh, and Saturn, I didn't use at that time hardly at all. Mm-hmm. And that was the third thing that finally made sense. Only made sense though when I had the other two things. Without it, uh, it was off and on all the time with Saturn. People would say, oh, I got Saturn doing this in my chart. And nothing happened. <coughs> they would be all fearful about it because Saturn's moving over their sun or Saturn's going over their ascendant. Or if you're around astrological communities, you hear that all the time. And generally, by and large, nothing happened. Now, sometimes it did. And uh, I found out the reason was is because the other two witnesses weren't there. When they line up, look out. Saturn's got his message. So, okay. So what should you do if you have all three things? If it was you, like, would you just like go indoors and see yeah, the lock the doors, get in the yeah, mm-hmm. hide, yeah. hide under the bed. The bed's gonna fall on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the, it's like the story. There's an actual. Can't get away from it. I mean, yeah, there's a guy. There's a story about the guy that uh, um, uh, he heard the Grim Reaper was after him and he was gonna take his life and uh, he got on his horse and he dr- rode like mad. And, almost killed his horse running away from this place. And he ends up getting to a motel, walks in the door, and uh. the Grim Reek persuading day. So what took you so long? <laughs> he, he was racing to his death, didn't even know it. So, okay, so, okay. Um, well, like you said, that girl, you, you, were, you helped her avoid committing suicide, so I, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, it's got its positive side. Okay, and God said, let there be sign, lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. This is something the Christians don't want to pay attention to, this next little sentence. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. Wow, really? It's for signs? What kind of signs are those, huh? What does a sign out here say? It says stop. What's the sign say? Merge. You follow those signs, don't you? That's what those are for. The planets are written in the heavens so that them that run may read. That's scripture. Did you know that? It's written in the heavens so that them that run may read. Did you know it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Night unto night showeth knowledge, and day, and day unto day uttereth speech. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And moreover, in keeping them is their great reward, and by them is thy servant warned. That's in the Psalms. So Sarah was the captain in an army. He, got, he lost the battle, but it says the stars and their courses fought against the Sarah. How can they fight against him? I'd like to know how they fought against him if they had no influence. But he lost the battle. Okay. Okay, how about these scriptures? Be signs in the sun and moon and the stars. Okay, in the, in the moon and in the stars. What? There'll be signs. There'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun shall be darkened by the moon and not give her light. What is that called? Solar eclipse. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Here's the scriptures in the Psalms 19 I was telling you about. It's all about their line goeth out throughout all the earth, it says. What do you think that is? Aspects. Their line. Okay? There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Did you know that astrology is universal language? You know, you can go to India, they know, they know what a Mars looks like, a Venus looks like, they know what these symbols look like. It's a universal language. It's maybe one of the few. It may be the only. Because action. it's the constellations in the sky? Yeah. Is that shit? Yeah. Yeah, and all the planet symbols, they know them anywhere you go. Okay? And by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them is their great reward. Ah, what kind of reward is that? Well, it prevents problems, can prevent all sorts of calamities in your life if you're aware of them, right? Okay. Even aliens might speak that language. There you go. Okay, so eclipses are recorded throughout history regardless of being a shadow of things to come. Um, Anyway, we talked about that earlier. Um, The pagans' uh, superstitions really weren't very accurate. Chaldeans in the 6th century had already calculated the periods of the eclipses. They were called seros to a degree of accuracy that is astonishingly close to perfect. So they understood astrology very well in the old days. Essentially the new moon as the shadow of things to come needs to be augmented by two other factors to produce a prophecy. This is where I'm coming from now. There's a scripture that I used to ascertain the likelihood of an event happening and it says except there be two or three witnesses 
to establish something that's not established in law. Now listen, that's where I get my, my knowledge from a lot of it is scripture because it's, there's so much hidden there. It's not established by law. We're dealing with the laws of heaven, with the laws of this solar system and what it's telling us. So when it says there's got to be two or three witnesses to establish something, I know that applies to this. That's why it works. This is really important too. When you're doing charts of people, I think I've told you this before, but I can't reiterate it enough. Don't make prophecies about things in charts that are not there. If the root of the tree doesn't prophesy something, don't tell them it's going to be this or that. For example, a person has a perfectly well-aspected, uh, let's say Saturn in their chart. There's not any afflictions to it, no squares, no opposition, nothing. And yet you see Saturn transit opposing that Saturn in that person's chart, or squaring, or whatever. And you read them a negative meaning of that. You're, you're missing the point. You don't read them something that's not in the chart. The fruit of the tree is not there. Don't give them a prophecy that doesn't have it already spoken in the chart. They don't have that lesson to learn or it would be in there. It would be a cross or it would be crucified in there. It would be a semi-square, 45 degree aspect to that planet telling you there's something you've got to learn now. You're going to have a lesson to get with this aspect. Okay, but then again, you still need two more witnesses. you got Saturn, let's say, doing something to Saturn in a chart. And it's, maybe you've got two other things lining up against Saturn again. If the fruit of the tree doesn't prophesy it, don't make prophecies about it. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see. And the other mistake I see with astrologers is they do, they'll, use, uh, they'll use transits against progressions. You can't do that, excuse me, but that's not, it's not accurate. You don't take a transit energy and say it's afflicting something in my progress chart and it's going to have a meaning. It's not about that. Always go back to the root of the chart, okay? Make sense? Okay. okay. Okay, progress moon. We've done this. We talked about it. How important it is. Progress planet. Okay. Now, that's another thing I want to say to you. You say, Ron, how come you don't use progress everything? I don't. I use only one thing, progress moon. Okay. That goes against almost every traditional astrologer's training and their, their seeming knowledge. Uh, that's all right. I mean, I don't tell, like I said, I don't tell people how to do their astrology. But think about this a minute. How much do you think in a lifetime of, let's take my life, I'm 78. In 78 years, how, how far do you think Uranus or Pluto's moved? In a progress chart? Not much. Not much at all? No. They should retrograde, like, then forget it. It's you got like, it. Yeah, you no, got it. no. And that's true for most of all no. those planets. The only planets that are going to be moving fast are, really, are Mars, pretty fast, okay, Venus, okay, um, and uh, uh, um, Mercury, yeah. Mercury maybe. Mm -hmm. But, but so, you know, people use these as if they're, you know, really influential. They're not. I, I haven't found them, say, let me say it for me. I try not to tell people how to do astrology, but stay with the, stay with these simple tools. They work so powerfully well. You know, the progress moon. Uh, don't don't start using progress to other planets unless you feel you have to. There's only one thing. Um, there's only one influence that I'm still not sure about, and I haven't been able to document it. And I was hoping I could because if I I figured I found something here, it's amazing, you know. But I thought there's got to be something else more. And one of the things I kept thinking was Jupiter. I thought, what if, what if Jupiter has the same meaning and possibility of interpretation in terms of events in people's lives as Saturn does? I can't find it. I've tried. Uh, the cycle of Jupiter is not, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's what, eight years, is it? What is Jupiter? Uh, 12, 12, years, 12. 12 years. 12 years. 12. So, you know, it's interesting, by the way, 12 is Jesus, 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 Jupiter, right? Mm -hmm. 12 disciples, 12 signs. So mm -hmm. there may be, here's one thing I'd like to say to you guys. And I, I'm, I told Karen uh, in Newfoundland too, I said, Karen, I, she's an amazing student. I mean, she's been with me a year, but I swear to God, she is amazing. Um, but I said, I want to see somebody pick up on this where I leave it, okay? I'd like to see somebody maybe do some more documentary study research on Jupiter. 
Okay, I haven't yet found how to put it into work and to make it work yet, but I'd like to see another book come out with uh, one more aspect that we're missing, and somebody might do that, okay? Um, and by the way, um, I meant to tell you, Barbara, you're, um, you were a nutritionist mm -hmm. in your background. Yes. You have a degree in nutrition or something? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and uh, it's an amazing aspect of astrology that you really should think about. Um, if you're interested in that, you, you have a direction towards those things. It's amazing what you can learn about. Because you, you have to recognize the early alchemists were really chemists. I mean, they were the alchemists that would be. Yeah, I told him. Yeah. You know. She, yeah. she also is a nutritionist. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's so much here that you can bring to bear with, with clients. Um, if you see certain afflictions in a chart, there's, there's some really, there's a book called Stellar Dietetics. Have you seen that? I don't know. But if you have certain afflictions, let's say you have afflictions to Mars, they'll tell you what you need to take. If you have the afflictions of Venus, you should be taking extra copper, for example. Yeah, if you, you know, Mars, you might be taking extra iron, or you know, but all these metals and um, uh, um, trace elements are connected to this astrology in a deep way. I wish I could have spent more years studying it. I've studied it quite a lot. I used to think in that direction a lot more than I do now. Uh, but I really encourage you to stay on that path. You know, it's a path that'll give you a lot of ability to help people because if you see afflictions uh, and you know that they got a lot of heavy Saturn afflictions, you know they're gonna have skeletal frame bond, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, all these things that help build their bones. You can help prescribe those, not prescribe as a doctor, but just recommend people take them. Yeah, that's another thing. Careful about prescribing. Careful about getting into anything that they can get on your case about, okay? And always be aware, I, I think I shared with you, there was a woman I know in Massachusetts who, uh, did I tell you the story about she got sued by her husband? So she got sued and they won. They, he won the case against her for called alienation of affection. <laughs> the wife went to her for a reading and she told him what a bad ass, excuse me, uh, <laughs> what a bad guy this was and how bad a relationship was and how it's going to, you know, this and that and the other. And she taped it. The woman, she let her tape it. And of course the husband got a hold of that and then ended up in a divorce and he took that woman to trial and he won a case against her for alienation of affection. Because all the things she said on that tape was right there. So be smart. There's a, there's a good scripture, um, uh, what is it? Uh, be as wise as serpents. But don't be a serpent, be as wise as one. Because a serpent out there will sting you if you're not careful. Can I ask Elena for another coffee? Another coffee, of course. Yeah. Elena, she'll make sure. Yeah. It's yeah. so delicious. <laughs> I wrote down the name of the machine. How long have we been going? About an hour? About an hour and almost an hour.